Hello, everyone. Welcome to Sci-Fi, Spies, and Democracy. Uh, this is the first session for the Anthill Inside uh, Science Fiction Book Club in 2021. And we have with us the brilliant Dr. Malka Older. Um, a few things that I would like everyone to keep in mind before we get started. Please keep your mics on mute uh, and keep typing in your comments and questions in the chat box. We shall take them at the end during the Q&A session. To introduce myself, uh, I am Vijay Lakshmi. I'm the author of Strangely Familiar Tales. My other writing has been published in various uh, journals and anthologies, and I also write on the regular for Women's Web. My co-moderator today is T.G. Shanoi. T.G. Shanoi is an SFF enthusiast and a columnist and critic. He's the writer of India's longest running weekly SF column, New Worlds Weekly, for Factor Daily, and the Spec Fix column for Bangalore Mirror. He also curates the SF track for the Bangalore Lit Fest. He has featured in podcasts such as the Tale Harate Kannada podcast and events such as the Sri Lanka Comic Con to talk about SFF in general and Indian SF in particular. He hosts To Boldly Go, a fun SFF quiz every Saturday. He is also an advertising and marketing professional and is currently a consulting partner with Celsius 100 Consulting. Our uh, wonderful guest today, of course, is Dr. Malka Older. Dr. Older is a writer, aid worker, and sociologist. Her science fiction political thriller, Informocracy, was named one of the best books of 2016 by Kirkus, Bookwright, and the Washington Post. And the Sentinel Cycle, of which Informocracy is a part, uh, was nominated for the Hugo. She is the creator of the serial Ninth Step Station, currently running on Serial Box, and her short story collection and other disasters came out in November 2019. She's a faculty associate at Arizona State University's School for the Future of Innovation in Society, and her opinions can be found in the New York Times, The Nation, and Foreign Policy, among other places. Chenoy, you've always loved the Sentinel uh, cycle, and you've always had much deserved high praise for it. So would you like to get us started today? Yeah. Uh, so the Sentinel cycle, which starts with informocracy, uh, continues with uh, uh, state economics and national states. I mean, it's probably one of my favorite recent sci-fi trilogies, right? So pardon me if I sort of gush a little bit extra about it. Uh, it's 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 brilliant, and it's uh, it's set about twenty years in the future, and uh, the parallels from you know here to there, it's it's sort of uh, res will resonate with anybody follows uh, geopolitics and how information is, you know, uh, affecting politics and all of those things. But to just sort of step back a bit, I mean, science fiction has always been about politics and, you know, engaging with power structures and imagining new uh, forms of government and all that sort of a thing. But, uh, and when it comes to forms of government, there have been enough, right? There's, you know, there's monarchy, there's even gerontocracy where, Governments are run by old people. Uh, there's even kakitocracy, which is government run by least uh, qualified, the thieves. Sometimes nowadays, you know, it seems like we are in a kakitocracy or a gerontocracy. But that apart, the only the form of system that's been running longest, or what we see across, is democracy. Now, uh, until informocracy came along, uh, there hardly any. Uh, books. I think there was one by Asimov or something which spoke about something that's at the heart of uh, democracy, which is the election. And that's what I absolutely loved about it, the way it looks at democracy. And it, it posits uh, uh, a democracy, uh, or rather a micro-democracy, in which each voting block, if you can call, is uh, made up of 100,000 people, uh, and it's called a sentinel. That's how the trilogy gets its name. And uh, and you have all these little sentinels across the uh, world and uh, there are parties which are trying to win sentinels and the ones with the maximum sentinels get to form uh, the uh, super majority and govern everybody is like a fascinating form of micro democracy i'm sure dr older will speak more about it but what i liked about it was the fact that it looks at democracy it looks at power structures there's this entity called the information which is think about all the social media that you can think of plus Apple plus Amazon uh, 
with a little bit of the UN's powers thrown in and you get this entity called the information, which controls the flow of data and controls the elections and makes sure everybody gets information that they need, which is why it's called information. So all these little things, and it's a world that feels very sort of lived in, right? And there's a lot of talk on, on policy and it's a lot, a lot of thought provoking things about democracy and power structures and what makes it even better that it's also got katanas and flame throwers, right? It's also got romance. It's also a political thriller, right? So, uh, I mean, I can keep going on and on. Like I said, pardon me if I gush too much about this book, but I'd like to see the stage uh, and ask uh, Dr. Older, just sort of introduce us to the world and how you came up with it and what, what, what you know, sort of sparked off the idea of the micro-democracy and how you created this world which sort of feels you know, very lived in. It doesn't feel sterile and, you know, you can relate to it and they're like, this is something that can come to be. Okay, thank you so much for that introduction. I personally don't think it's possible to gush too much about my books, but that's my opinion. Um, anyway, I appreciate really hearing this. It's always, it's always great to hear from people who appreciate the books. And I think you described the system pretty well, but I'll just, I'll summarize again for anyone coming in late. So it imagines this world of what I call micro-democracy in which uh, the basic unit is 100,000 people. So in a very dense place, that's a couple of city blocks, or it could be just miles and miles of rural area. And those 100,000 people can vote for any government that they want that exists anywhere in the world. At the time of the book, it's, there are roughly 2,000 governments uh, all over the world with different issues and interests and policies. Some of them are very localized and some really compete on the global scale. And so what that means is that as a government, they would have these pockets of constituents, maybe all over the world. Uh, and as someone living in the world as a citizen, you could move into a different country by crossing the street. Uh, and all of this, as uh, TG said, is facilitated by this big global bureaucracy called information. So uh, I, I came up with this idea basically out of frustration and annoyance with the way things are in the world today, which I think is, is not a bad way to start writing speculative fiction because you know, a big part of speculative fiction is it's really not prediction so much, although sometimes there are elements of prediction in it, but a lot of it is really uh, just trying to present an alternative to the world that we are living in now. Whether you do that through alternative history, whether you do that through um, dyst dystopian stories, whether you do that through science fiction or even whether you do it through fantasy. It can all work to show us the things that we sort of, that we take for granted in our world and show us that they could in fact be different. So that's what I was trying to do. Um, I had worked in, worked and visited and lived in a number of different countries uh, that had um, secessionist problems. Uh, whether it was an all out war uh, as in Sri Lanka where I, I was working for a year um, in Indonesia, where it was sort of a post-conflict situation, uh, both in the East and in Aceh, um, in Sudan, which was in, in kind of both in different parts of it, or, uh, you know, places where it was a terrorist movement, like in Spain uh, with ETA, um, or places where it was going to referendum again and again, like Scotland. Uh, basically, we see that all over the world, we have, even in what are at least nominally democracies, uh, because except for Sudan, all those countries are democracies. We have collections of people who don't want to be part of the government. Um, and I was, you know, I was really frustrated with all the, the, the terrible things that occur because of these attempts to succeed and, and, and why a government would really want to keep people who don't want to be in their nation there. Um, and so I, I, I was thinking about that. And also I was thinking about, you know, in the United States, which is the country where I, I vote, um, we, we were having elections and, and each election, it seemed we were getting more granular data about who's voting for what. So, and you can look, obviously we recently had an election um, and you can look and see, and, and, and they can tell you down to a very small level, you know, which county or which zip code uh, voted for one way or another to the percentage. So you see these little dots of in the US, red and blue. And so those represent people who have probably pretty fundamentally different ideas about what they want out of their government. And to me, it became very frustrating uh, to, to, to think about how we're sort of all glommed together into this massive country 
for, for no particular reason, um, with people who have very different ideas about what they want and, and keep going back and forth. So, you know, I started to imagine what it could look like uh, with a couple of different changes. If instead of worrying about territory and landmass, which honestly in today's economy is really not so very important for a country's uh, economy or status in the world, instead of that, if we, if we thought more about population and if we narrow democracies down to a much smaller size uh, and were much more flexible then in the choices that we had in government, um, I, what that would be like. And I wasn't trying to create a utopia. I was trying to, again, both reflect on the world that we live in and see how things might be different and, you know, put out a sort of proposal that I didn't think would work perfectly, but I thought would have some interesting, interesting points to it. Um, and then I had the, the information, this, uh, this vast bureaucracy that manages all of the information access in the world. Um, because of course I was very frustrated with information misinformation the way it stands now in the world. So um, that's that's where it came from. And yes, I just want to repeat at this point after having gone through all that wonky stuff, katanas, flamethrowers, throwing stars, chase scenes, fights, romance, definitely. So yeah, there, it's it's also there's there's some fun in, in the book too. Hey, I mean, well, of course it's 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 fun and uh no, that's what I, that's why I said you know beyond all the serious policy wonky stuff, there's a lot you know there's a lot of things going on and it just sort of keeps makes it look like sort of a, a page turner, but in the nicest way uh, uh, possible. So um, of course people have described it as a political thriller. I mean there's shades stylistically the shades of cyberpunk and all, but the world per se. Uh, I mean you mentioned the word utopia, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I've I've seen people. Look at it from both sides. Some people say, "Hey, listen, this is sort of dystopian." Some people are like, "Hey, listen, this is utopian." But then I've always said that in every utopia is it depends on you know who it is a utopia for. If it's mm -hmm. dystopian, who it is a dystopia for. So uh, the the world of informocracy and of the sentinel cycle. I mean, from your perspective, I mean, like you said, you are not trying to create a utopia, but practical and sort of pragmatic. Given these are terms that are banded often and as people use it as shortcuts, where, where do you think it would fall? What What's the ratio? Uh, well, I, I think what you said is such a good point that, you know, when we call something a utopia or even a dystopia, it depends who you're talking about. Because if we think about even the most famous dystopias, uh, there are people in them who are doing very well for themselves. Um, and and so that's, 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 you know, fundamental because I think what we are attempting to do in the world <laughs> for the last three centuries or whatever with democracy is, is to try to even that out a little and say that, you know, we, we, we have to find something that works out more or less for everybody, or at least for a majority. And obviously it's not working perfectly. <laughs> there are some big problems with that. Um, part of it being that majority bit. Uh, and there's a lot we have to work on, but it's, you know, it's still the way that we're trying to push towards something that's more equitable in how the, that utopia dystopia balance uh, goes. But in terms of my book, Personally, I, I think it's a very hopeful book. Um, I don't think everything about the world I describe is better than where we are now, but I think quite a few things are. Um, and mostly what I think is hopeful about it is that all the main characters pretty much are working towards a better world, even if some of them disagree on what better <laughs> means uh, and disagree quite, quite seriously with each other. But you know that there are people who are really engaged and for whom it is their job, they are paid to try to make the world better, try to make democracy work better, um, try to make governance work better. Um, and so for me, that's very hopeful. But I will say quite a lot of people have said that the book is dystopian or terrifying. It's been on a lot of best dystopia to read after you finish binging Black Mirror, et cetera, type of lists. Oh, yeah. Um, so and I think, you know, I think partly that has to do with the surveillance aspect, because information as this, this you know, massive information management um, system, it does, you know, there are cameras in, in pretty much all public spaces, uh, not in private spaces, not inside homes, but in pretty much all public spaces. And all that video is available to everyone, not to mention everything else like search result data and so on. Um, and I think people react to surveillance. There's sort of like a knee-jerk connection of surveillance to dystopia because of 1984. Uh, and certainly, like, I, I, you know, I don't think surveillance is ideal, but 
I, when, when people bring this up, I tend to point out that the level of surveillance in, in the book is actually not that much more than what we are, what we see today in quite a lot of places. Uh, but the difference being that the, the, the results of the surveillance, the data is available to everyone instead of just being available to either the state or a, you know, a patchwork of companies, which usually then make it available to the state. Um, so I, you know, I think that uh, there's some really important issues there in terms of who has access to the data and how it is used beyond just the simple fact of the data existing. I mean, that, that, that's a very good point because I mean, one of the reasons that we shy away from giving out data is that you don't know where, you know, who's going to do, uh, have access to it. You don't know how much of you is out there. And, and, and uh, I think uh, Informocracy came out in, and I think one of the reasons why people look at it as dystopian and all is the fact that uh, Informocracy came out in 2016, just as the elections were happening. Uh, and the fact that, uh, you know, there, there was a whole Cambridge Analytica thing that came out and how they were trying to sort of quote unquote hack democracy, right? And the parallels between that and the information, right? Where sort of, uh, you know, between Facebook and the information or, you know, or, I mean, they exist in silos now, but whereas uh, information is a monolith. So I, I, a lot of it, I'm sure, is coming from there, whole hacking democracy bit. Yeah, I think so. And I mean, you know, my, yeah, the book came out in the summer of 2016, but uh, all of those issues of, of fake news and manipulating information for democracy have been around longer. I think they really like <laughs> smashed us in the face in 2016. And there was a level of organization there, I think also that got higher. But, you know, I always remember um, the 2004 election in the US, there was this um, perpetration of a fake news story that was probably influenced the results of the presidential election and was so pervasive at the time. Um, it was about John Kerry's service in Vietnam and it was a bunch of people who'd been on a swift boat. And it was so important at the time that it became a verb. So people would say to swift boat someone. And then it disappeared. Like it was, it was, you know, it happened in 2004 and blah, blah, and then the election was over. There was no way to dispute it. You know, we still, I mean, I think this is one of the things globally in democracy that we need to start thinking about is, you know, what do you do? How do you evaluate something that is unfair in an election does it matter if it's domestically perpetrated or foreign perpetrated? Does it matter if it's, you know, automated with bot farms or if it's individuals? And, and is that something that we need to, to deal with in our elections? But um, it just, you know, after that happened, it just sort of disappeared. And then we were all shocked all over again when we uh, returned to, to fake news. And so, you know, it's, it is something that has been around for a while. It's, it's really scary. It's one of the things, honestly, that I was trying to sort of solve uh, with information, but as soon as I came up with this idea of, you know, a single source that people would believe in for information, it was also immediately obvious to me that this was an incredibly dangerous and terrible idea, <laughs> of course, because as soon as you have that source, if it gets corrupted, then, you know, you have no recourse. The power, part of the power that we have is having lots of diverse viewpoints. But as we see, you know, in most of our information environments, the, the, the majority of those viewpoints and the ones that are the most powerful and the loudest have been corrupted. You know, they're 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 very much. Uh, it has to do with the economic stru structure of the corporations that run them, uh, and it has to do with the, the number of outlets that a single corporation might control, uh, and it has to do with the the, the structures of, of how we see news and what makes people look and where they get their money. So there's lots of reasons why we have have these problems. Um, diversity of news sources is not solving them, and so I wanted to look at what it would be like. Uh, with the single news source, knowing that there was this huge element of, you know, possible corruption and certainly uh, possible skewing that would go into that. But think about, you know, what it would look like if instead of having very limited choices in our government and tons of choices in information, we had, you know, one mostly choice for information and lots and lots of choices for government. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, uh, the same news can be interpreted in multiple ways, uh, right, depending on of you come and even down to you know what we call quote unquote uh, you know uh, analytics and all that sort of thing like they say you know there is lies damned lies in statistics <laughs> one of the uh, things that you spoke about is like to choose between you know, who rules us or who forms the government and all which brings me to the parties in uh, uh, the sentinel cycle uh, you know the heritage and uh, of course I'm, I'm 
policy first which is your favorite and i like this you know they're uh, in that you know policy first leaders later yeah. right so uh, can you just for those who not i could go on like i said but then uh, i'd like our participants to hear it from you who not uh, read in crazy about policy first and what in policy first and leaders later means um sure so yeah i i i had to come up with a lot of different ideas of governance which um which was actually a lot of fun <laughs> um so some of them are kind of obvious jabs at certain existing either governments or ideologies um and and corporations you know quite a lot of them are formed of a group of corporations that band together and think okay if we're a government now then we can decide taxes in our favor and labor laws in our favor etc uh some of them are kind of single issue ish like there's some that are all about e- economics there's some that are all about the environment um there are a lot that are really you know small and local because i think that that's you know there's 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 quite a lot of people and places for which the local issues are really the most important and they just want a government that's right there that's that's concentrating on on their local problems whether it's you know i don't know some environmental problem that has to do with the the river right there or the economic problem that has to do with the single commodity that they grow in that place and so on um and there's some of them that are quite interest based so like i came up with a hello kitty government which is all about like cuteness and anime and people having fun with that and you know that's great they they have a good time and and there's uh you know there's the rastafarian rastafarian party of course i mean there has to be like that's the thing i think we have you know and if we think about the different ways that we have allegiances beyond our nationality uh i mean facebook is is one model for that um slack groups are another model but we see people kind of going into these groups of of um interests that you know have some governance application to them and and also just involve community and people getting together so so you know i was interested in in sort of that area and then as you mentioned policy first which yes yeah, it's definitely who i'd vote for um and and it's it's you know so much of our politics again this is all stuff that i'm frustrated and annoyed with uh in the real world but you know so much of our politics has to do with personalities i'm actually super annoyed with with how people call governments populist uh which i think is a terrible term because any government any party that wins an election in a democracy is by definition populist Popular. because people have to like it uh but also just you know um what we're really talking about is typically with those governments is is personality cults that form around some charismatic person who says the things that they think people want to hear and that some group some subsection of people want to hear and it really has to do with the person uh and then you get this really weak link between um the vote and what actually ends up happening what the government actually does uh because it's very hard to p- hold people to their personality if that's what you're voting based on that's not something that you can look at later and say oh you know i i thought i would like to have a beer with you but then you know after i saw what you did in government i i don't want to have a beer with you anymore you know that's a, it's it's not something that you can tell them oh you broke your promises right um and and so much of our political conversation certainly in the US is focused around you know what did the person wear how did they look on stage did they speak well i mean speaking well you know at one point in the history of US democracy was kind of important because you used you persuaded people in debate to vote and that is not really uh such an important factor anymore and yet it's a huge part of the criteria that we're given to judge politicians <laughs> um so you know i i really wish that we would move away from people um in our political decision making and focus a lot more on what the policies are that they represent um or not have them represent those policies at all but just vote directly for the policies or have anonymous people or have it you know short terms that are decided by lottery there's pluses and minuses to that cuz obviously experience is 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 worth something but you know the way, the way we're doing it doesn't work so we need to explore other ways come to india <laughs> sorry yeah i mean it's it's no, i mean hardly a us only problem that's just the one that i i know the best but yeah i mean really most countries when we look at the they they very much make their politicians into these public figures these these celebrities almost um which also then means that you have the people who choose to to go for those positions 
want to be celebrities, which is just never a good idea. Um, and yeah, it's, it's just a, a very destructive process all around. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there are a lot of quotes from Informacy that keep coming to mind in recent times. Yeah. But uh, okay, to kind of move away a little from, um, you know, the elections and the democracy to the writing of uh, the uh, books. Um, like you mentioned earlier, you've worked around the globe uh, in many places. You've had more than eight years of experience as a humanitarian worker. Um, I just uh, like to know how those experiences influenced how you approached the writing of the Sentinel Cycle, because the books have this uh, really nuanced understanding of global politics and, uh, you know, cultural diversity and all of that. Well, as I said, I mean, the whole idea in a lot of ways just came from my experience being in a lot of different places and seeing the things that are, you know, that are similar problems everywhere. And also seeing the things that are, that are the differences and that let me see my own country that I'd grown up in, in a different light. Um, so that was, a, that was a big part of it. Um, I also, you know, I was very conscious as I started writing um, the book starts in Japan because uh, that's actually where I was at the time when I when I finally started writing it, and that was this, this the image, the first image of the book, which is in Japan, was sort of the thing that gave me a hook for all these philosophical political ideas. I had to put them in a in a time and place in the future. Um, so it started in Japan, and because it was a, a novel set in the future in Japan. I, I naturally kind of thought of cyberpunk and used some of that aesthetic to draw, start drawing the books and the characters out. But I was also very conscious that, you know, cyberpunk and indeed science fiction in general, particularly, you know, this was, this was a few years ago when I started writing, uh, the popular stuff, the stuff that you come across if you're not um, digging is kind of focused on a very small number of countries. And that, you know, I, I, I wanted to do something different and also, uh, I have a kind of a philosophy where they say, you know, they say, write what you know. I find it very effective to write what I miss. Because if you miss something, you typically have a very powerful emotional attachment to it. And you want to bring it, when you bring it to mind, you know, it comes very vividly. Um, and so, you know, I tried to write about a lot of the places where I had lived or had traveled. And so that gave me some, you know, I wanted to be putting myself back in that world and remembering the food and, uh, the people and the places that I had been to. Um, and it was a lot of fun also to take this very, um, very flexible and decentralized idea of governance and think how would this play out in different countries and different cities? Because countries, of course, are obsolete in this world, but the, the cities and the locations that I had been, as I said, you know, I had a lot of fun coming up with different governments. And part of that was thinking, you know, what kind of governments would the different parts of Jakarta vote for? Or, you know, what kind of government is gonna take hold in um, Qatar? Or, or what kind of government, you know, what happens in the US? Uh, how does it divide into different governments? So, you know, that there was a lot of, of that just, um, it was, you know, it was really fun to go through and, and kind of, and, and, and populate it with that diversity. I wanted it to be a global book. No, I, yeah. I, I sort of remember how the idea of the Sentinels sort of resonated and sort of sparked off a lot I, uh, when I did the giveaway of informocracy. Uh, one of the questions, uh, I mean, the question that I asked uh, people uh, who want to participate in the giveaway uh, uh, of informocracy was, I mean, what would Indian Sentinels look like? Mm -hmm. And it was such fun to watch because people were like really engaging with the idea of Sentinels and had some really fun stuff like people saying, you know, the Manahali Sentinel is fighting with the BTM layout Sentinel over silk board toll taxes and you know <laughs> who owns the traffic jams. But, but I, I liked how you know sort of they were taking the idea of the Sentinels and sort of applying it to what we have. And there was this, this uh, Sentinels where you know just sort of very feminist and all of that. So it's an absolutely great idea. There's so much you can do and play around with it. I, I really just think it's such a shame that in, in most countries and all countries we're so limited in the choices we have in government when in fact there are so many more you know inventive and interesting different ways that we could go and how we organize ourselves and how we govern ourselves so yeah it was, it was a lot of fun to, to think of that. Right. Uh, other thing that was also interesting to me which you introduced in uh, the Sentinel Cycle was the idea of narrative disorder. Mm -hmm. Uh, right, I mean, Mishima suffers from narrative disorder where she seeks narratives and stuff like that. And uh, 
you had the short story also called narrative disorder in which you know uh, it's treated as a, as a condition and it's diagnosed and people who have narrative disorder sort of you know have to engage with sort of not just created content they turn reality into a narrative try to come to their own conclusions and you know sort of with our minds being wired so much with all the information that we're getting via twitter this that whatsapp and you can't you know distinguish sort of sometimes fake news from fact and stuff like that and i remember uh, in my interview with bruce sterling he told me that you know fake news is actually design fiction mhm yeah <laughs> it's probably the most effective form of uh, design fiction and sometimes yes. it feels like you know we're all suffering from narrative disorders are we yes yes we are i mean in my in my conception of this we are all suffering from narrative disorders but it's a spectrum so we're on different parts of the spectrum um depending probably on on kind of our our inclination for fiction i personally am very deep in narrative disorder i have a severe case uh which is why i you know either came up with it or named it depending on how you want to think about it but narrative disorder has has two sort of symptoms or parts of it one is an addiction to narrative and i think most of us like if you are at a book club on a friday you probably have some narrative disorder <laughs> you probably really enjoy fiction um and narratives in general i mean narrative is not only fiction but you know narrative nonfiction is very popular now and we see narrative techniques being used in uh news stories and oh my gosh like when you look up a recipe online you have to read through how many pages of narrative before you get to the actual recipe about you know the person's grandmother who gave them the recipe and when they found it in the book and this is all narrative like we we have just we're now in a place in our society like culturally and and in in many of our societies cuz culturally where we just love to have stories and like i said i am supremely guilty of this like i have my my overdrive queue from the library i have all these books on hold and i'm constantly looking for more books and 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 it's also it's it's a bit ironic because we are there are more stories available to us than we could possibly get through i mean only netflix only what i can get out of the library on my kindle it's immense and yet we are still always looking for the new thing that's coming out and you know the sequel from our favorite author or um the new movie that's had a lot of hype or whatever it is so you know it's a it's a really interesting dynamic i think so that's the one side then the other side is that as you keep ingesting these narratives and particularly if you kind of invest them in ingest them through one relatively narrow cultural framework okay so if you always watch hollywood movies and if you always watch a certain genre of hollywood movies you're going to start to you, you know your brain gets accustomed to those patterns that's what narratives are for for teaching our brains things and you're going to start to see those patterns places uh sometimes where they don't exist and sometimes where they exist because other people who are stuck in that same groove are enacting them uh somehow into the world and so that's that's it's a double edged uh sword i guess for for mishima the the sword woman um for this character who i have who's who has a very severe case and you know sometimes it helps her and it gets her to these amazing insights because she knows the narrative beats that are going on and sometimes it can be uh tricky because she expects a narrative type pacing or or beat or storyline that isn't there because it's the real world <laughs> and the real world doesn't always have those sort of neat uh pacing and beats and closure and 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 things um and and certainly because it's a diagnosed thing in this future world her her bosses and her colleagues are sometimes skeptical of it you know it's an easy thing for them to say oh you're letting your narrative disorder run away with you um and you know it's it's the sort of thing that i think people have have had for for centuries probably but they would think of it as something else like oh your hyperactive imagination is an imagination that is fed on lots and lots of stories in fact don quixote which is an example of you know someone who literally <laughs> read so many what were romances at the time which is not uh you know love romance but is about knights going off to fight things romantically read so many of those that he went off and did it even though he didn't actually have anything to fight um like that is a very literal example of of narrative disorder um i must say about uh, the narrative disorder it was my one of my favorite parts in the book for very very obvious reasons 
but uh, uh, also you know like you mentioned the people around mishima you know are wary of uh, uh, the narrative disorder and um, you know they uh, use it sometimes to dismiss some very legitimate concerns and ideas of hers uh, but she uh, knows that it's her superpower so you know i really liked that it was a very um, um um affirming and positive representation of uh, neurodiversity and you know so thank you for that but yeah i mean as i said it's it's very much me <laughs> and 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 i was you know as i wrote it i was thinking about how um we have these different ways of looking at things and depending on what's going on societally and culturally they get diagnosed as a disorder they get put in certain boxes or they get ignored and people just kind of deal with them without having a name to put on it. And so, yeah, I, I was definitely thinking about that dynamic as well. Thank you so much. Uh, moving on um, to some of your other work. Um, so, I mean, you have your collection of stories, which is, uh, and other disasters. Uh, you have uh, stories in magazines like Tor, uh, The Slate, and most recently in Constellation. Um, I'd like you to tell us a little bit more about those. But before that, uh, there's one particular story of yours, Tear Tracks, which, uh, you know, I, connecting to what you were speaking earlier about, you know, uh, the cult of personality. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, this particular story, Tear Tracks, it really uh, beautifully explores how vulnerability and pain can be strengths. And more uh, importantly, it speaks about uh, how leaders themselves uh, you know, it's essential for them to be uh, uh, vulnerable and open about their vulnerabilities. And, you know, in, in what we, the trend we're seeing worldwide is to elect people who project this very different idea of strength, which is almost very toxic. So, uh, you know, could you tell us a little bit more about uh, what made you write this story? You know, why did you think this was a story to tell? Yeah, absolutely. And I'm also going to put just a link to my um, my website with the list of publications there because that has the links to all the free stories. So if anyone hasn't read this, they can they can find that story from there. Maybe you can put it in the YouTube as well. Um, so yeah, this story, I you know I I had I I knew someone a little bit and they had something really terrible and sad happen to them, and they dealt with this with a, a really incredible amount of grace. And it just made me think about how little we value that and how little we um, in particular, you know, value that sort of, the sort of character that allows someone to deal with such a situation uh, and, and, and grow from it and, and, you know, respond to it and remain dealing with other people. Uh, and, and yeah, contrast, as you said, that to the sort of things that we do put, that we do put value in. Um, and in the story, the way that the this alien civilization deals with it is perhaps not perfect. Like they're very focused on the thing that happens to the person as opposed to the way that they respond to it, the way that they, uh, what it does to their character. But, you know, I, for me, that's, I think that's very typical of um, humans, perhaps when in aliens, we don't know if we're aliens, but for, uh, you know, the stories are about us really. And, and it's very typical about how humans will take, um, some kind of value or, or criteria. And because it's difficult to evaluate that, go to a proxy variable, right? Um, you know, so we are, we want leaders who are, I don't know, intelligent in a certain way. And we take this proxy variable of them being able to speak memorized talking points in, you know, an effective way or having sharp banter with someone else on a debate stage. And, and take that to mean, oh, they're, you know, they're smart and they're quick and, and they can be decisive. Uh, and so, um, so, so yes, it's, it's really a story about sort of the different kinds of, of things we can value. And, you know, in the story that the human who meets with this alien civilization has suppressed all of her vulnerability and, and all of the sad things that have happened to her because they're not valued at all in her society. And, and that is kind of, the, that would be the key to dealing, to interacting with this alien society. But because they can't see their cultural differences, um, she's not able to find it in that first visit. <laughs> Maybe things will change in the, in the future. 
Um, at this stage, uh, let me just tell everyone who's uh, here with us on Zoom that you can just type in your questions. I mean, we will be going to uh, taking your questions uh, in a very short while. You can type it in the chat. If you're watching us on YouTube, please type it in the comment box, uh, comment section of YouTube, and it will be conveyed to us here. Uh, one last thing before we get into the QA, uh, q and is, is I wanted to uh, ask you, Malka, about uh, the course that you're uh, teaching. Or hmm. predictive fictions at the ASU. I mean, we've always known, I mean, science fiction, most people say, okay, this novel predicted that, but we all know that the writer was just you know, extrapolating and it just happened to come true. But you can't deny that there is a sort of, uh, feed, you know, sort of a, a feedback uh, or a loop between a sort of science fiction and technological uh, fact. And I, I looked, I, I saw the syllabus that, you know, people have been informally following and reading, I found it very fascinating, you know, how you sort of creating these frameworks to look at future studies and all of that, you know, what you call predictive fictions. Could you just tell us a bit about, you know, how you're going about it and what the outcome is, what, what the experience of it has been uh, teaching the course and how science fiction lends itself to this, I mean, non-SF also, of course. Mm -hmm. um, great question. And yeah, I'm really happy to talk about it because I'm pretty excited about this course right now. I was asked by ASU to develop a course that was something around science fiction. <laughs> and um, we eventually came up with actually talking about sort of the relationship between science fiction and the kinds of prediction and, and descriptions of the future that we don't think about as fiction. Um, so in the course, we're reading things about meteorology um, we're reading things about cost benefit analysis and macroeconomic forecasting um, and uh, polls, polling, political polling. Um, and uh, also um, disaster planning, which is much more my area. And then long-term planning like 50 year plans or uh, how, we, how they model climate change. Uh, and so, you know, kind of the, the point about all of this is that all of these things that we think of as just like, oh, you look at the weather forecast, that's telling you what the weather is going to be, are, are really involve a lot of guesswork and uncertainty and indeterminacy. Um, the same is very much true of economic forecasting. It's true of all of these, right? Uh, there's a degree to which they're manipulated by the people who, who create them and have certain interests. And there's a degree to which we just don't know and it's guesswork, right? Um, but they're presented to us in society very much uh, as, as you know, somehow rigorous calculations of the future that may be wrong, but if they're wrong, it's you know something like probability. Uh, oh, you know the whole Nate Silver defense for the the polling errors. Uh, you know we showed that there was a seventy percent probability of this happening, and it didn't happen, so we were still right. Uh, and so what we're thinking about in the course is how you know all of these things are fiction. Why do we prioritize some and not others? What are the skills and, and the calculations that are involved in science fiction? Um, and how can those, uh, how can we sort of relate these two different ways of thinking about the future, more than two, but you know, the, the, the supposedly nonfiction ways and the fictional ways, how can we relate them and integrate them into something that gives us really a better idea of how we can relate to the future, how we can plan the present uh, and act to, to change our futures. So it's, um, again, I put the, the link to the syllabus in the chat here, if people wanna take a look. Um, we're only in the actual course <laughs> that I'm teaching, we're only partway through week three now. So we're still quite early on to see uh, how it's going for the students. It's a lot of reading, um, and but I've been really, really pleased with the discussion so far. And I've been really pleased with the discussion that has come out on Twitter as I've been sort of live tweeting my my review of the readings for my for, for when I record my lectures. Um, and you know, people come up with really wonderful and relevant examples uh, that are quite different from what I thought of, because this really is a very wide issue. You know, almost any area that you think of, we have these projections of the future. And again, they're usually presented in a way that does not suggest they are fictional. Um, so, you know, I, I found it really a really great interaction. Um, and and I'm I'm enjoying looking into it a lot. I mean, I, I am a little behind in the reading, so I just need to uh, <laughs> do the it catching up. A lot of reading. Yeah. And, yes. Uh, yes. 
uh, yeah, I would love to be a student, but at the same time, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think they feel the same way. Um, <laughs> and of course, there's science fiction in there too. You know, we, we're reading um, The Gurkha and the Lord of Tuesday by Saad Hussain, which is just, you know, just hits on so many interesting topics. Absolutely brilliant book. It's so good. Um, and it's a lot of fun. Uh, and we're reading The Parable of the Sower, which I think is like, really just one of the most important things that you can read about politics today uh, and was written, you know, not only before this happened, but it was written in 1993. So like way before we got to this point uh, and really predicts things in a way that a lot of pundits missed. Uh, doesn't get everything exactly, of course, but that's not the point. You know, the point is, is giving us the sense and the emotion of what's going on. Um, and uh, what else we're reading? Some some essays by Le Guin and essay by Octavia Butler as well to go with Parable of the Sower. Uh, some some short stories. Uh, we're reading The Pushcart War, which is a children's book that has you know very little technology in it, but is always set in the future. So it was written in the 50s, and each subsequent edition moves the dates forward so that the the events in the story always happen in the future from when you're reading it. And they're treated as history because the book is supposedly written much farther future than the events happen. Um, so it's and it's a really brilliant book about resistance and um, economization and, and other things. Anyway, so you can look at the syllabus. There's a lot of cool stuff on it. Um, and and yeah, I think it's 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 important to us to think. You know, as we, you know, a lot of us here I think are, are very focused on the science fiction side. Keep in mind uh, when you're thinking about this as you know a fun hobby or an insightful, but very fictional kind of, you know, fun, not serious way of reading, you know, keep in mind that a lot of the things that we think of as serious and rigorous and part of our economies and our governments are also fiction <laughs> and are not necessarily, do not necessarily involve more research or more thought or more consideration or more rigor than some science fiction, not all science fiction. Some science fiction is also terrible, <laughs> um, but, but some of it. Surgeon's law applies. Okay, and some of some of the best fiction you will find is in election manifestos. So you know. also, also. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I mean part of my my inspiration for this course came from there's there's an entire book by a disaster sociologist um, called uh, Mission Improbable Fantasy Documents. It's by uh, Lee Clark, and it's all about the the planning and contingency plans, mostly by industrial um, companies about what they will do if there's an accident. And he just goes through and absolutely dissects them in terms of how they're totally unrealistic, totally fantasy. Um, it's uh, not comfortable reading, but it's very good. And so, yeah, it's, it's really, this is everywhere. This is, you know, a lot of the stuff that we are told to take very much at face value is, is fiction. And so you need to treat it in the same way that we treat fiction in terms of thinking about who is writing it, uh, how, you know, how is, it, how is it structured and built up and what are they trying to get? So we'll, we'll take questions. Uh, before that, one comment. Uh, Gautam Bhatia comments that one SFF reader and writer has titled their Twitter handle Narrative Disorder in Honor of Infomocracy. We'll, after this, we'll go and find out. Uh, uh, Pacific Leo uh, says on YouTube that an anonymous leader is a novel idea. I've never heard of it before. Uh, the reference to policy first. And asks uh, a question. Your description looks very similar to sovereign individual. Uh, was your work uh, inspired by that? Did it take anything from the work Sovereign Individual? Um, first, just to just to comment on the, the anonymous leader idea. I also have a short story, which you can read online, which is um, kind of goes more into that idea. It's called Candidate Y. And you can find the link to it on that, that page that I gave you, or you can Google my name and my WordPress site, and then you can find it. Um, and no, actually, I, I, I have not is sovereign individual a book or a yeah it's a book it's a book i haven't read it so no but but i will say like there's a number of books that kind of look at these ideas of the different ways that we could be structuring government and our our allegiances um ada palmer's tara Ignata series is often mentioned with mine um also elliot pepper's analog series um which are both great so if you like mine you know those are those are other books to delve further into these um they're different but they, they deal with a lot of the same issues and concerns. And, and I think there's really um, a, a feeling around that this, this nation state system that we've been in for a couple of hundred years, not really that long, um, 
in terms, you know, civilizational terms or societal terms, or, or definitely not in all of history terms, it, it's kind of cracking at the edges and we need to be thinking about what comes next. And hopefully, you know, ma managing that transition in an intentional way and not just sort of falling into whatever the power structure is set up for us. Sorry, okay, that was a long answer. Go ahead. <laughs> no, that, that's good. It's, it's always good. Uh, so one of the things about informocracy was the fact that there are nation states are no more. Mm -hmm. Right, uh, uh, but almost no more. Yeah, there, almost there, no more. There are a couple left, as we see in mostly in book two, and a little bit. Yeah, the, the yeah. stragglers, the stragglers. Yes. Yeah. All right. Uh, which brings me to a question that uh, Venkata Subramanian CV has asked, saying, you know, nationalism, ex uh, example in India, has been used as a way to unite diverse set of uh, people of different ethnicities, religions, and language into sort of a common union. Such a scenario can micro democracies be counterproductive if they do? Uh, will it not lead to further divisions and complications instead of unifying people? Mm. Yeah, I think that's a really that's a really good question, um, and it's it's definitely an issue. It's it's it is something that I deal with somewhat in the book, uh, like in in Infomocracy, the first book. You definitely see how a lot of these things are underlying, and these these divisions kind of make it easier for fake news when it when it comes out and other types of sabotage to to manipulate people because they can just grab that demographic all in one chunk right um, and I, I also get into it a bit more in the third book where there's some some sort of explicit discussion of whether information should be limiting the types of government and for example not allowing uh, white supremacists to form a government, even if they're in the majority. Like, are, do they limit this, you know, beyond basic human rights, which they have, and beyond uh, some sort of environmental minimum standards, which they put in uh, between the second and the third book? Um, do, do they do that? And so I have, you know, I have a couple of, of, of answers to that. Uh, one is, yeah, I mean, the, the system is not supposed to be perfect, right? So th there is this problem, there's this flaw. Uh, one way to think about it is, that and 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 you know one way that I sort of, of thought about it as I was writing it was that uh, you know I think that those governments that focus so much on uh, nationalism around specific identities as their their reason for being are not going to do very well as governments and so uh, with these sort of very clear uh, delineations between different governments and lots of information about what's going on in different governments and also typically. A uh, very free immigration between different places, uh, those governments are going to shoot their shot and go extinct, hopefully very quickly, um, is, is sort of the hope <laughs> behind it. But it's a tenuous one because we know that, uh, that you know, we have centuries of people using that type of thinking in very seductive and problematic ways. So I don't know if that's enough, which is why, again, in the third book, we come around and have this discussion of information. You know, information is not only this, this information management, they're kind of the, the organization that lays down the rules for how this government works. Um, and the rules are, you know, they're pretty, they're pretty slender. Mostly it's, it's decentralized and it's up to the sentinels what they do. Um, but there are the, a couple of, of rules about how, what they have to follow if they want to participate. And, you know, it's debating, it, do we include this? And if so, um, how, do we, how do we manage it? Um, but, you know, I think that, I think that it's, 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 it's one of the issues that keeps evolving. When we moved from, you know, when, when we moved into this nation state system, right? Uh, th there was this idea of nations, like groups of people that were the same in some kind of way, fitting into geographical areas. This is obviously never going to work because people move and ide ideologies change and borders change. Um, but it, it had this ideal, which has caused all sorts of terrible problems and misery for the past 150 years all over the world. Um, but then we also got to this place where we had sort of new countries in quotes because of course they were taking over other people's land but they were they were countries that were formed without a uh, ethnic basis of people who live there so if you're France you can be like okay people who speak French in some version or other should be within our borders and everyone else we can decide to kick out or call them visitors and we're going to sh make sure our borders line up and we're going to fight with Germany over these areas that are bilingual and then we'll figure it out and we have our French inherent Frenchness territory, right? Uh, 
But then if you start uh, a new country taking over other people's land in the United States or Canada or Australia or South America, then you're dealing with, with something different where you don't have that group that you believe is inherently attached to that land in some way. And you have to come up with other reasons. And so now we have these, this weird phenomenon of nationalism that's not really tied to any inherent characteristic. It's mostly tied to where people are born. Um, and yet we also have immigration processes. So like sometimes it's tied to where they choose, but only in certain cases. And, you know, to me, that's, it's, 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 it's a real problem, but it's also kind of very slow half step away from, you know, if we can, if we can sort of get people <laughs> to realize that uh, the random place you're born is really not a good way of deciding who's exceptional or who's on your side or whatever, then that takes us a step further away from these ideas of, you know, ethnocentrism or, or, or religious or whatever other grouping of, pe of people based on inherent characteristics that they can't change um, and sort of takes us a little bit farther from that in, in group ad group. So I think there's like this slow moving away and in the books, uh, the people in, in you know, the, the higher ups in information who, who are sort of behind this whole idea, they're hoping that the Sentinels will gradually pull people further away from those old allegiances. Um, but it, it definitely hasn't happened yet. And there is the risk that instead they become more ingrained in smaller groups. So yeah, again, a long answer, sorry. I talk a lot. No, 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 that's, that's good. I mean, what you said actually reminded me of the classic Tom Gold cartoon about us versus them, you know, built on sort of nationalism and national pride, you know, our yes. enlightened people bear barbaric hordes. Yes, exactly. Like our glorious leader, their tyrant. And then it's the same people depending, you can see, right. Uh, exactly, exactly. The more we can get ourselves to sort of lift out of where we are, uh, you know, the, the closer we'll come to that. Um, Dr. Ulta, there's a question uh, again about tear tax. Uh, which I want to ask because it's a perspective that I never thought of. But uh, Ujwal asks um, a question I had about the short story tear tracks. Does cyclopean society have, have patriarchy of a form, given that leaders in this society are chosen by how much they suffer? And if suffering is disproportionately, uh, disproportionately experienced by women, uh, and he quotes, they do appear to be mostly female, though Fleur counts three phases of the 38 that scan to her as male. It might point to major differences in their traditional gender roles. Yes, that's a great question. Um, and you know, I, I should say that it's it's noted in the in the story that uh, they realize that female and male are probably not the right words to put on these aliens, but they're reacting to how they perceive the aliens physiologically on the basis that in that case, the aliens will have a similar reaction to their own. And they're thinking about how the aliens will respond to them in, in terms of having gender balance in their mission and so on. Um, so, uh, but, but I think it's an interesting question. I'm inclined to, to, to say it goes the other way because I think that, um, you know, we have lots of characteristics in our criteria for, for leadership in our society that in fact, are more predominant among people who are marginalized one way or another, but those people still don't get more chances at being in power. So um, my suspicion is that in fact, women are some women, you know, the, the, the people that read to, to the humans as female in the society are somewhat dominant. And so even though the, the, the suffering of the types that are described in the story are more or less evenly distributed, the, the, the females have more chances to take on leadership roles. Um, but I think that's a really great question and a really great unpacking of, of the story. Right. Uh, Gautam Bharti asks, uh, do you think SF needs to take political economy more seriously than it does at present? Um, uh, yes and no. I mean, I kind of think that people should write what they want to write and not everyone needs to, to have political economy as one of their um, specializations or obsessions. I mean, I think there's plenty of great SF stories that are, you know, either focused very much on the sort of individual relationship, domestic, uh, smaller level, or um, or just have a very different interest in what they're trying to do. Um, so on the one hand, no, on the other hand, uh, I 
I find political economy really fascinating. So I'm always interested to read new takes on it. And I think certainly, uh, you know, our economy and the ways that we run our politics are one of the things that's, that's most, um, you know, ingrained in our society in the way that, as Ursula Le Guin noted, you know, make it very hard to imagine things running in a different way. And so that means it's also very, very important that we have people who think about how it could be different and present those in plausible narrative formats so that we can more and more imagine something different. Um, so yes and no, <laughs> I don't wanna tell anyone else what to write and I don't wanna tell anyone else what to read either, um, except to read widely. Uh, but so, so yeah, yes and no. I mean, I think there, there are some examples that have done really interesting things with it lately, but it's, it's, there aren't that many um, science fiction novels about democracy, as I know, because I've, I've looked, I've been asked to look. There aren't that many novels at all about democracy, actually. Um, yeah. I think because we kind of consider it right now the apex of, of governance, and that's a problem. We need to keep get, making it better which is why I think it's a, it's a fertile um, narrative territory. And uh, there's some about e economics, but uh, there could be a lot more done with it. So nobody has to, but I'm always interested to see those who do. Right, uh, I think a connected question is there from Anushri uh, who asks, is there some sort of science, uh, science fiction or fantasy you wish would be written more of? Um, I, you know, again, I think people should write what they want to write. And mostly I'm interested in, in reading stuff that I haven't read before. So I, you know, I don't know what that's going to be necessarily before I see it, but I want to read stories by people who have had very different experiences than I have and therefore come up with totally, totally different things than I would ever come up with. Because if I could come up with it, you know, I don't necessarily need to read it. Um, but there's so many different ideas out there. Uh, and there's so many people who have just you know, either really bizarre or just really makes sense in ways that I just wouldn't have thought of really, really put together that way. So yeah, mostly I want to read stuff that I haven't, haven't read before. Um, there's certainly some themes uh, that, you know, I notice being missing that there've been a couple of anthologies, I think that were about things like uh, pregnancy and parenting in the future, which is something that you don't see a lot of in science fiction, which again, doesn't mean it needs to be the whole story or book about it, but but that part of life tends to be missing. Um, and gosh, I think, you know, I think there's a lot about, there's, there's, we have a lot of things that have singular heroes who are exceptional. And I kind of like to see things about groups that, that work together. Um, I don't know, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of difference. I just want to read stuff that I haven't read before. So, yeah. Um, the, um... Uh, Nikita Deshpande asks, uh, after older, do you see a difference between the way EOC and other non-white people structure fantasy and sci-fi from what is the standard fare published? What kind of story structures do you enjoy personally? Hmm. And a, um, related, a related question uh, hmm. from Nikita Deshpande herself, what have you personally enjoyed reading recently? Mm -hmm. um, so... Yeah, I mean, I, I think I think that particularly in the U.S. Um, and I, I mean, for me too, I see the gap really. Like publishing is not great, but publishing is still a lot better than movies. And so I think you you can see the gap between what gets published and what doesn't doesn't. But it's hard to see sometimes what doesn't. But you can really see the gap between the books that get published and the movies that get made. Um, and so if I look at kind of the standard structure in movies, uh, it's a little bit, you know, what I was talking about. There's that one hero who's usually in a certain demographic and is usually really annoying um, in one or another way. And, uh, and the, the violence works out in certain specific ways. And like, yeah, they're really annoying. Um, so <laughs> uh, I think that, that, yes, people who have been othered in one way or another in the society that they live in tend to have a very different perspective on what the future looks like, what the present looks like, uh, how stories can be told, um, what what is heroic and what is not. Um, and, and I would certainly like to see more of those kinds of stories. Because as I said, I don't like reading stuff that I've already read. 
or seen movies that I've already seen, even if they're dressed up with different CGI and a different, you know, supposedly attractive actor or actress um, in the lead role, uh, I still know what's going to happen. So I'd much rather read stuff that's that's very differently structured. Um, and what have I personally enjoyed re reading recently? Mm, okay, so I just read uh, Winter's Orbit, which is coming out soon from Tor or Tor.com, I forget which, uh, which was, I think, originally a, um, a fic. I think it was originally on AO3. And so that's, oh. I, I think so. I, I, I kind of came at it sideways, but that's what I've, I've heard. And it's a, it's a really fun story. Um, I'm about to read and I haven't yet, but I have the arc for the sequel to um, A Memory Called Empire, which I'm really looking forward to because I loved the first one by Arkady Martin. The new, one is called, yeah, the new one is called A Desolation of Peace. I haven't read it yet. I'm really looking forward. Um, also, uh, I, there's a, a new, I don't know if it's come out yet now because I read the, the arc a long time ago, but um, there's a sort of sideways sequel to The Goblin Emperor by Catherine Addison. <sighs> Uh, which is which is great, as you would expect. Um, what else have I read recently that I loved? Uh, I, I like constantly reread the Murderbot series, and there's a new one of that coming out as well, uh, which is great. <laughs> um, so so definitely, I always recommend that. Um, uh, da, 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 da. Yeah, I think those are sort of the most the most recent ones that I've been through. Um, yeah. And yeah. Sorry. You were saying something, Shanoi? Okay. Uh, one last uh, question, I think, uh, from Pacific Leo again. Um, they ask how narrative disorder is different from mal maladaptive daydreaming, like in Walter Mitty. Um, yes. And also, the other thing that I think might have influenced it, though I wasn't thinking about it at the time, was um, Pattern Recognition by William Gibson talks, you know, there's, there's quite a lot about that, that sense of finding patterns that don't exist. Um, it's it's uh, somewhat similar. I think maybe I would say that, that uh, the maladaptive daydreaming is kind of a subset of it. Um, but narrative disorder isn't always necessarily focused on the self. It can be in some people, but in a lot of times it has to do with the way other people are acting or the way sort of things are happening in the world um, where you put them into a kind of a, a, a causal sequence when there isn't necessarily a causal sequence there. Um, so, so yeah, I think there's, it's, it, that would probably fall under the umbrella, but there's, there's many other forms of the way it can, it can play out. Yeah. And one thing with daydreaming dreaming is, is, is always some form of wish fulfillment. Uh, I, I don't even know if, if in narrative disorder there is always wish fulfillment. Yeah, exactly. So that's that's right. one big difference that I see between daydreaming and narrative disorder. Narrative disorder yeah. isn't always wish fulfillment. Yeah, I mean, I think some people will do that. We'll have it always be about them getting something they want. For a lot of people, it's, you know, uh, you know the, the, the sort of anxiety of what terrible thing could happen next. You know, if I were in a movie, obviously, I would be the person who gets caught in this big, terrible thing happening. Um, and then I would get out of it somehow because I would be the hero in the movie. But like, you know, I'm expecting this terrible thing to happen to me, even though it's very low probability because I, you know, I'm centering myself in this story, uh, for example. And, and yeah, there, and again, sometimes it also doesn't have to do with the person. I mean, when Mishima uses it a lot of times, she's looking at the way other people act and saying, you know, Hmm. If, you know, given the, who's going to be the villain here, given sort of the pacing and the things that I see, or, you know, who, who, what would their next move be given the narrative that I have, that I've built up in my head about this person in this, or this collection of people up till now. I mean, if you were in a movie, I think you would totally survive. Uh, katana <laughs> in one hand, flamethrower in the other, as long as you don't open, a, open your wallet and show off picture of your family to someone because that's right. anybody who does that is guaranteed to die that is exactly that is exactly like narrative disorder is thinking of because we have these things that are so built into our head of like the characters who do this in movies always die so we don't we don't want to do it even though you know that makes absolutely no sense um another good 
take on this is is um, Scalzi's red shirts. Red shirts, so put good there. Right? Um, so yeah, I think there's there's a lot of people who who kind of keyed onto this in different ways, but but yeah, that's exactly it. Yeah, so I guess that's about it. So those of you who haven't read the Sentinel Cycle, which starts with Informocracy, please read it. I mean, it's discussed all the awesome things uh, at this thing, and you know, sort of out of time, but we could still go on and on talking about speculative uh, resistance and whatnot. Mark uh, uh, Alders on Twitter, uh, m underscore older, so you can follow all our work. Her, you know, thoughts on speculative resistance, which I absolutely love, especially the bits where he said, you know, countries should pay people to be their citizens, uh, you know, competing against each other for a better world and other such. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, I, I guess, yeah, we just sort of three minutes away from close. And I think, you know, uh, great audience, great questions. So I think that's a wrap.